one holy lamb. Atonement day, a shepherd cries, another spotless lamb must die. Oh, how good just one sacrifice, our God Jehovah satisfied. Year after year, the blood would flow, but none could wash me white as snow. Salvation's day fulfilled the plan, the promise came one more. I could not pay One holy lamb One great I am One seed of Abraham One holy lamb Wash my sin away Atonement day The Father cries The spotless Son Of God must die one final death for every man, one blood, one life, one holy lamb, one holy lamb, wash my sin away, one sacrifice, pay the price I could not pay, one holy lamb, one great I am, one seed of Abraham. So maybe we uh, we could begin uh, with a word of prayer. Our God and our Father, we are so thankful tonight for your word. And as we've been talking, it's a life-changing, eternity-changing word. It's from you, and it's directed to each one of us personally. We're so thankful for it. Guide us through it tonight, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So I'd like to look in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 and we're going to begin reading in verse 13 and one of the company saith unto him that's the lord jesus master speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me and he said unto him man who made me a judge or a divider over you and he said unto them take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth, possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods." And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Amen. So we'll go back and just look at those verses. <clears throat> uh, the Lord Jesus had been speaking to a great crowd. We find that in verse 1. And uh, one of the those that were there 
We don't know if he was a disciple, a follower of the Lord or not. And he says, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. So this man had an issue in his family and he wanted the Lord to fix it. We don't know what the problem was between his brother, but we know that problems between brothers go on and they started right outside the Garden of Eden. Uh, Cain did not get along with his brother Abel and in fact killed him. So we don't know who's at fault uh, in this uh, situation with these two brothers, but we do know that the Lord who knew this man's heart spoke after this man made his request, spoke about covetousness. Covetousness is a, uh, a lustful, unsatisfiable desire for more money, more material things. And he had that evidently in his heart. And so the Lord says to him in verse 14, man who may be a judge or divider over you. The Lord did not come into this world uh, to fix the social injustices of this world. He didn't come into this world uh, to make this world a righteous place uh, because he knew that uh, the world would reject his message and crucify him. Uh, he gave opportunity for individual men and women to have their lives changed, their hearts changed, but the world, he came into a sinful world, and when he left through the cross, he left a sinful world. So he didn't come to change the government of Rome. He didn't come to change the injustices and the sinful things, evil things that went on in Rome, uh, their idolatry, uh, slavery. He didn't come to do those things. The next time he comes, he's going to set the whole world right, and there will be righteousness when he is king. But this time when he came, he came for individual souls, uh, souls that they might uh, see the truth of God in Christ and they might repent of their sins and receive him as their Messiah. So he says, I'm not going to deal with the situation that you brought before me. And he goes on and he says, 15, take heed. Now this is important. He says, take heed, beware of covetousness. So covetousness, you know, one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet, this is a serious thing. And it is particularly serious in a nation like ourselves that was filled with so much money and material advantage, like perhaps no other nation in the world. Now, covetousness can exist in anyone's heart. You don't have to live in a wealthy nation. You can live in poverty and have a desire uh, for things. That's not the point. But we in the United States have a very, very uh, covetous and materialistic society, and, and, and it's ingrained in us from the time that we grow up. We, we learn to, uh, to want more and more things. You know, advertising on TV is always uh, showing us these flashy things that, uh, you know, we just can't live without. And, and always, if we don't have a need, advertising tries to create a need, and then they try to sell us something. So it's just part of the society, the world that we live in. But the Lord says this. He says, a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. This is so contrary to what we really think. I mean, there used to be a program on TV called The Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Why did people watch that show? Because it's something that is uh, uh, stirs us up to see these great uh, wealthy people with uh, tremendous yachts and, and homes in different parts of the world and to see how they live. And uh, that is covetousness. That is, uh, you know, they can be very immoral people, very greedy, not respectable people at all. And yet here we are admiring them. Why? Because they have a lot of money. You know, God is no respecter of persons. So we have to be careful that when someone has money, we don't treat them differently than we do someone that's poor. Because in the sight of God, each individual is important, one as important as the other. He gave his son for every human being, and wealth has nothing to do with it. Uh, I'd like to read something in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 5. You know, uh, Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon. He is perhaps the richest man that ever lived. And uh, you don't have to turn to it, it's in the Old Testament. 
But in, in chapter 5 of Ecclesiastes, in verse 10, it says this, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. So he's got an abundance, he wants more, but he won't be satisfied. Solomon says this is emptiness, this is vanity. He goes on, when goods increase, they are increased that eat them. So when, when uh, you uh, gain more uh, uh, money and more material things, then you have more costs involved in it. He says they increase that eat them. And what good is, are they to the owners thereof? Listen, listen what he says. He asks this question, what good is this increase to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? <laughs> I love that. So here's a man that has more money than he could uh, he could spend uh, in 10 lifetimes, maybe 100 lifetimes. All he can do is look at his money. All he can do is look at his bank account. All he can do is, is uh, uh, know how much he has, but it does him no good. And so uh, verse 13, Solomon concludes, This is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely riches kept, listen, kept for the owners thereof, to their hurt. So he says, this is, a, this is something that is, I see it in the world. Solomon is a very wise man and he, and he saw the things that went on in the world. He says, I've seen people that increase with much material things, but it's to their own hurt. They end up divorced from their wives. Uh, they end up going into, you know, things like drugs, alcohol. They, 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 they end up living lives that are not respectable at all and certainly not for God. <clears throat> so going back to Luke chapter 12 and verse 16, and this is the, the parable that the Lord told uh, 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 regarding this man's question. So he's talking about covetousness, and he talks about, in verse 16, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do? <laughs> so this is interesting. Here this guy has a bumper crop. I mean, bigger than he ever, ever uh, contemplated that he would have. And he says, what shall I do? Well, the obvious answer would be, since his barns are already full, the obvious answer would be, well, give to the poor, uh, give to the fatherless, give to the widow. You know, use this excess, this bountiful blessing God has given you to help someone. But he doesn't think that way at all because he's covetous. And this is the point the Lord is making. Covetousness blinds you. In fact, the Bible says in Ephesians 5.15 and Colossians 3.5 that covetousness is idolatry. It's, it's worshiping something that is material. You remember uh, Israel made the golden calf and they worshiped it. And uh, 1 John chapter 5 uh, and verse um, 21, John says, keep yourselves, my little children, keep yourselves from my idols. Well, covetousness is a form of idolatry. And so John ends his first epistle by saying, watch out, watch out for covetousness. And that's what the Lord says here. Beware of covetousness. Take heed, he said. And so this rich man, here he's got this, this great blessing, and he says, what shall I do? Well, this is his answer to what he should do. And he said, I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will bestow all my fruits and all my goods. So his barns were already full. He already had a great blessing. And, and uh, yet he wants more, and that's the thing of covetousness, never, never satisfied. Uh, I'm going to read something out of Psalm 49 in verse 17, talking about the rich man. When he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. It's often said there's no U-Haul behind a hearst. Uh, his glory shall not descend after him. You know, this doesn't matter how wealthy the Pharaoh was. When they buried him in the tomb, he rotted just like any other man, no matter how wealthy he was. Now, the, then Psalm says this, Psalm 49, 18. Though while he lived, he blessed his soul, and men will praise thee when thou dost well to thyself. Isn't that amazing? Let me read that again. Though while he lived, he blessed his soul, and men will praise thee when thou dost well to thyself. 
In other words, when you're covetous, when you're greedy, when you live, you know, the high life and spend uh, everything you can on yourself, men will look at you and praise you. They'll admire you, just like we said earlier, that this is the corruption within the heart of man. And so this fellow goes on. He says, I'm going to build bigger barns. And when people see me build, building bigger barns, they're going to be, you know, thinking, wow, I wish I was like him. And that's probably true. And he says, I will, verse 19, and I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat and drink and be merry. Now I want to ask you a question. Why wasn't he happy already? Why, why does he have to wait until he builds these bigger barns, this uh, project, building project, until he brings in his bumper crop? Why, why wasn't he happy already? This is the thing about covetousness. Yeah, covetousness says, I'll never be happy because it's a, it's a part of the sinful heart. And you can't be happy with things. Only love can satisfy the human heart. And love is only in God through Jesus Christ. You know, no man who's covetous, no matter how much he has, can be content. There are multitudes, multitudes, multitudes of men and women that are very wealthy, but they're not content. They're dissatisfied. You know, contentedness, it's been said, is to be content or happy, satisfied with what you have. Contentedness is to be happy with what you have, to be satisfied with what you have. That's the opposite of covetousness. Covetousness says, I need more to be happy. So this man, he, he's on a false premise. He thinks that material things, the more he gets, the happier he's going to get. But we already read that when much goods increase, you know, problems come with it. I'm reminded, you know, of a man named Nabal in the Old Testament. Nabal uh, was a man, he had just finished shearing his sheep and he had this great party and he was very drunk. And because he had dishonored David and because he was a sinful man, God took his life. In the midst of his party, in the midst of his, you know, rejoicing over all the money that he brought in with his sheep being sheared, God took his life. He didn't get up that morning and prepare for that party thinking he was going to die. No, but he did. And there's another man, uh, in, that was in 1 Samuel 25, another man named Belshazzar in Daniel uh, uh, chapter 5, and uh, he did the same thing. He was having a party, honoring himself, and then there was a hand that God brought in and wrote on the wall, and uh, it said, you've been weighed in the balance and found wanting, and he died. So these two fellows in the midst of their parting, they died. This uh, rich farmer in the midst of his plans to build bigger barns, he dies. And, and uh, this is... Uh, this is so instructive because what God says to him in verse 20, he says, God said to him, thou fool, you fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. I'm requiring thy life. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. And this man was dishonoring God all through his life, disobedient to him. And God said, listen, I've had enough. And that's true for every sinner. That's true for every sinner. God has a certain number of days that he's long-suffering. And he was long-suffering with me. Oh, praise his name. But he's long-suffering with men. In other words, he, he allows them to go on in sin so that they might repent. But this man did not repent. And so God said, enough. And he's going to judge him and require his life. And after uh, the Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed unto men once to die, after this the judgment. So this man, he left this posh life that he lived, where he was top dog in, the, in, in his society, and he will be damned. He'll be in hell. He's in hell right now. Now this is a parable, so the man's not truly in hell, but anyone that lived like that, or today lives like that, will be in hell, will be damned. And so uh, the Lord says in verse uh, 21, so is he that provideth, uh, that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You know, God gives us blessing, not that we can uh, be greedy for more, not that we can be covetous and want more. It's that we can use what God gives us to honor him. 
And this is so important. Uh, it's, and it's such a difficult lesson to learn because we have a sinful nature that truly believes that more money means more happiness. And that is a, a lie. But if you want to have heaven's view, there's a little story I heard. It's about a gardener, uh, a man that took care of another man's uh, grounds. Uh, he was a groundskeeper, a very wealthy man. And, and this man named John cared for his property. Well, one night, John, this godly man, had a dream. And the, in the dream, he dreamt that the richest man in the valley was going to die that next night before 12 a.m. So John cared about his master. He went to him that morning and said, you know, I've had a dream. And uh, the richest man in the valley is going to die tonight before 12 a.m. Well, the master of the house, he didn't think much about it. He thanked John. And, and then as the day went on, he began to get worried. So he went to the doctor. The rich man did. And he went to the doctor and the doctor said, no, you're in great health. You're as fit as a fiddle, so to speak. And, uh, but the, the man wasn't satisfied, so he asked the doctor to come to his house for dinner that night. And so the doctor came, and uh, the man kept watching the clock and, and, and kept the doctor in the house until 12 o'clock. And then he felt relieved that he was not going to die that night, and the doctor left. Well, after the doctor left, there was a knock on the door, and it was John's oldest daughter. And she said to the rich man, she said, my father has died. And of course, the point of the story is the richest man in the valley did die before 12 a.m. But it wasn't the man with a lot of material things. It was the man that knew the Lord, a man that was rich in faith, a man that was rich in good works toward others. John, he was the richest man in the valley. And so we need to have a change of our view and, and, and view uh, riches, not in the way of wealth in this world, but what about storing up treasure in heaven? That rich man and that we just read about, the rich farmer, he had no treasure in heaven. He had prepared no treasure for the next world, the next life. And I want to tell you tonight, you give your life to Christ and you can have treasure in heaven. Even though you might not, uh, even though you might be, um, you know, a little older, you're, you're not in your, you know, a teenager or youth, one day living for Christ. You can have more treasure in heaven than you can a lifetime without him because you'll have no heaven and you'll have no treasure without Christ. So you need to give your life to Christ. You need to be sure that he is your Lord and Savior, and then to use whatever he has given you, not just material things, but all of your energies of your life to honor and to glorify him. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Our blessed God and Father, we pray, if anyone listening tonight has not received Christ, they might open their hearts to him. There is a, a riches, there is a treasure that uh, is available to every man and every woman in Jesus Christ. He was the rich one in the glory of heaven, and he became poor that we might become rich. And that is not materially rich, though it might include that, but it's riches of salvation. So my friend tonight, trust Christ as Lord and Savior, and with everything that God places in your hands, live for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.